Greetings, Embers, and welcome to Back to Ashes. My name is Phoenix. If you would like to learn how to become a member or buy me a coffee as a special thank you, those links can be found down below. Also, if you are new here or you have been here and haven't done so already, please don't forget to subscribe, like, share, and comment. Not only does it help push this video into the algorithm, but it also helps the channel. And it also reminds you of every time I upload a video. With all of that being said, it is time to go back to ashes. For once we arise from the ashes, we are a bigger, brighter, stronger, and a happier person in the morning. Sit back, relax, kick back, grab a snack, or tuck in and get warm, and prepare for this dose of vocal melatonin entitled True Kidnapping Stories. Right after this intro and ad will play, I'll read the first story and ad will play, and after that there will be no more ads within this video. Disclaimer, some of these stories may contain material not suitable for all. Listing discretion is highly advised. Michael Donahue Four-year-old Michael Donahue disappeared from a playground in Victoria, British Columbia in March of 1991. At the time, he was playing just feet away from his parents. Michael's father momentarily turned his attention away from the playground, and when he looked back, Michael was gone. Police presumed that Michael had been abducted, but no one witnessed him being taken from the area. Canadian police launched a massive search for Michael and amassed a number of tips from the public, none of which panned out. Twenty years after his disappearance, the Victoria Police Department continues to investigate. Most recently, there was widespread speculation in a small British Columbia town that a young man who bore a striking resemblance to Michael may have been the missing child. But DNA tests determined that he was not. The last unconfirmed sighting of Michael was in June of 1991 when a man attempted to abduct the seven-year-old girl in New Jersey. The girl and a friend claimed to have seen a little boy matching Michael's description in the back seat of the man's car. However, this sighting has not brought police any closer to Michael's disappearing fate, nor have any of the hundreds of other tips from the public throughout the years. Cody Johnson Cody Johnson was a 25-year-old country boy who loved cars in the wilderness. He was looking for a church-oriented woman he could share his life with. He met the tall, pretty brunette, Jordan Graham, and they began dating. You would have never guessed they had issues if you saw their smiling pictures on Facebook. They presented a great front and Cody didn't grasp the depth of their problems. Cody was head over heels in love with Jordan. He cooked for her and brought her gifts and gave her tons of much attention. A week after meeting Jordan, Cody told his mother, I think I met the woman I'm going to marry. However, Cody's friends grew concerned as the relationship seemed one-sided. They'd never seen the two of them kiss or hold hands. Jordan was cold and distant. Jordan was extremely religious and wanted to wait until marriage before having sex. Cody was fine with it. But he could hardly get her to kiss him. She reassured Cody that she loved him. One year into dating, he proposed and she said yes, which is where the path to ruin began. Jordan's friends said she was excited any time they talked about planning the wedding the party, and all it involved, but never said anything about Cody. On her wedding day, as Jordan walked down the aisle crying, onlookers smiled, but her maid of honor, Katrina Martinez, was horrified. She knew Jordan and knew this wasn't a good cry. Jordan had been asking Christina in the weeks leading up to the wedding if she should go through with it or not. Katrina told Jordan, I can't make that decision for you. You need to talk to Cody. Cody's best man knew there was trouble beforehand, too. 
He said he told Cody not to marry her. Something was off. He could tell Jordan wasn't in love with him, but Cody was blinded by his own feelings. The day before getting married, Jordan had a massive meltdown, telling her friend she'd made a mistake, but then changed her mind and moved forward. Ominously, they had a custom song made for their wedding, and one of the lyrics said, You help me climb higher for a better view. You're my safe place to fall. They attended church on the Sunday morning of July 7, 2013. On the way out, witnesses said she told her husband she had a big surprise for him. Prosecutors later alleged Jordan had promised to do something sexual with Cody. He made exciting comments to his friends before they left, and they later found a blindfold at the crime scene. The next day, Cody's work called and asked where he was. His boss, Cameron, was excited to congratulate him on the wedding. Cody didn't answer his phone, so Cameron went to his house looking for him. Nobody answered the door. Cameron sensed something was wrong and broke the door in. Nobody was inside. He said the home gave him a terrible vibe. He wandered through the quiet house and eventually found Cody's phone on the ground in the garage, which was totally unlike him. Cody always had his phone. Cameron rushed to the police station and reported Cody missing. The cops immediately wondered why his wife wasn't the one reporting her husband missing. A friend finally got a hold of Jordan and asked her if she had seen Cody. She said she didn't know, but later told the cops, He went out with a bunch of friends I've never met. I don't know anything more, any of the whereabouts or anything. Friends and cops were immediately struck by how unemotional Jordan was with Cody's disappearance. When friends came to her house to provide support and comfort, she grew agitated that they were there rather than upset Cody that was missing. At one point, she got upset and threw her wedding ring across the room, which caused a chill to run down everyone's spine. Then, there was a random email that Jordan received from a mysterious man named Tony the Carmen. Hello, Jordan. My name is Tony. There is no bother in looking for Cody anymore. Cody is gone. Call off the search. He fell off a cliff at Glacier National Park. She took the message to the cops. Search parties went out. Jordan participated and drove with her friends to the park. During the drive, she was happy, singing songs and hanging her head out the window, flying in the wind. You'd have never known her husband was even missing. At the park, Jordan led her group to the exact location of Cody's body. She said she just had a feeling he'd be there. His body was at the bottom of a steep remote cliff in terrible condition. She told her friends, Cody told me he wanted to see the spot before he died. This drew even more scrutiny to Jordan. She started fudging details and changing her story during an interrogation. Jordan didn't help herself when authorities asked, How did you locate the body so fast? This time, she said the spirit of Jesus Christ led her to his body. Cody's best man said, I almost instantly thought Jordan did something. At Cody's funeral, Jordan sat in the front row playing on her phone, smiling and unaffected. People who also passingly knew Cody were more emotional than his own wife. It was at this point that her friends all concurrently knew that Jordan had murdered her husband. Cops later confirmed that the mysterious email from Tony the car man had been sent by Jordan on her dad's device. Jordan admitted to pushing Cody. She said they'd been in a fight. She said she was so upset that when he turned his back to her, she shoved him hard in the back, sending him over the edge. He fell 300 feet to his death, landing head first. There wasn't even a struggle or self-defense argument made. She said she just did it because she was angry. 
But because of so many other lies, mounting evidence, and a complete lack of caring for her dead husband, it was an obvious case of murder, in which she kidnapped her husband and then pushed him over a cliff. She entered a guilty plea. On March 27, 2014, Jordan was sentenced to 30 years in prison with no possibility of parole. Cody's mother is inconsolable and his family is still coping with the loss. Cody was murdered eight days after their wedding ceremony. It's hard to imagine how things could go so wrong so fast. It's even harder to fathom how someone could find breaking a person's heart harder than killing him. But stranger, darker things have happened. Rest in peace, Cody. You didn't deserve it. Adam Walsh Adam Walsh's abduction turned out to be the one that started it all. It was far from the first major child abduction that swept the American airways, of course. But Walsh's parents pushed so hard for kidnapping resources after his tragic tale that the 1980s saw a major surge in anti-abduction activism. Four decades later, Adam Walsh's story is still felt by millions of Americans, and the unfortunate little boy's legacy still reverberates through law enforcement agency, victim support groups, and countless grieving families. Adam was with his brother, Revy Walsh, in a Sears department store in Hollywood, Florida, on July 27th of 1981. The six-year-old boy asked his mom if he could go with some older boys to play video games in another part of the mall. She said yes, and he ran off to have fun. Revy shopped alone for another 10 minutes, then went back to check on Adam. However, she could not find him anywhere in the department store, and nobody had seemed to notice the young boy running away or being led out of the store by somebody else. Frantic, Revy panicked and called the police. Florida cops immediately got on the case, and the stricken mother's husband, John Walsh, rushed to the scene too. Sadly, Adam was never seen alive again. His remains were found two weeks later. Nearly overcome with grief, John moved to take action. He wanted to prevent this from ever happening to another family. So he got the wills in motion to start the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children. The NCMEC wouldn't go into effort for a few more years. And after a few more high-profile kidnappings, but it still serves children across America today. John also began filming the legendary true crime show, America's Most Wanted. And in the early 2000s, an Amber Alert precursor called Code Adam was instituted in public places nationwide to assist law enforcement in cases of kidnappings. Years after the young Walsh's awful murder, Serial killer Otis Toole took responsibility for the death. He was already in prison for other murders he had committed, along with other sadistic killers named Henry Lee Lucas. Florida cops couldn't bring a legal case against Toole. They didn't have evidence he actually committed the crime. They worried his confession was simply a way to seek media attention. However, in the end, they pieced together Tool's unknown whereabouts in 1991 and realized he could have been telling the truth. It didn't bring Adam back, but the frank admission may have had at least placed the final puzzle piece in this terrible tragedy. The chilling story of 16-year-old cheerleader Hannah Anderson, who was abducted by the man she knew as Uncle Jim after he tortured and killed her mom and 8-year-old brother before burning the house to the ground to cover his own crimes.
A popular crime documentary had laid bare the chilling true story of a 16-year-old girl who was kidnapped by a family friend after her mom, brother, and pet dog were brutally murdered. Hannah Anderson was abducted after cheerleading practice by then 40-year-old James DiMaggio, who had tortured and killed her mother, 44, and brother, who was 8, earlier in the day before setting his California home on fire with their bodies still inside. Hannah was left unharmed, but scandal continued to engulf the case with questions about her relationship with the assailant as well as demands for paternity tests. Here, FEMAIL, or female, had laid bare the disturbing realities after an episode of FBI True explored the sordid story. The harrowing story began with a report of a fire at the home of James DiMaggio in August of 2013. The fire department responded, but after quelling the flames, were horrified to discover a body that had been tied up in the garage. It was that of Hannah's 44-year-old mom, Christina, who had been tortured with obvious signs of a struggle. She was found with duct tape wrapped around her neck and mouth several times, as well as having plastic cable ties around her ankles, the San Diego County Medical Examiner's Office said. Christina had suffered more than a dozen blows to the back of her head, forehead, and nose. She had also suffered cuts to her neck, believed to have been inflicted through the tape after she died. But the horror did not end there, because inside the house, police found the charred remains of Hannah's eight-year-old brother, Ethan. Investigators said they could not determine how the young boy had died due to the extensive burns and tissue loss. They said gunshot wounds, asphyxiation, or burns from the house fire were all possibilities. The Anderson family's pet dog had also been shot and killed. Authorities quickly determined that somebody had set the house on fire by using incendiary devices on timers. Given the intricate setup, police soon decided that DiMaggio was the prime suspect. DiMaggio had been a close family friend of the Anderson family, with the kids referring to him as Uncle Jim, but he had already shown a more disturbing interest in Hannah. Having previously taken the teen and her friends on a trip, DiMaggio reportedly told her, if you and I were the same age, I would totally want to date you. Christina had reportedly asked DiMaggio to take Hannah to cheerleading practice on August 3rd because she was at Ethan's football practice, and so she was unable to do so herself. San Diego County Sheriff's Detective Troy DeGaulle said in a report at the time, but the student never returned home, and her absence sparked an intense manhunt spanning much of the western United States and parts of Canada and Mexico. During this time, Hannah's father, Brett, was away in Tennessee as part of a three-month work trip, but promptly issued statements directly to DiMaggio once it became clear that he had abducted the team. He said, Jim, I can't fathom what you were thinking. The damage is done. I'm begging you to let my daughter go. You've taken everything else from me. Brett also added, Hannah, we all love very much. If you have a chance, you take it. You run, you'll be found. Hannah was photographed with DiMaggio in his blue Nissan Versa at the California border checkpoint shortly after midnight. The description of the vehicle was released and it was soon found abandoned near Cascade, Idaho. The car was covered in brush and the license plates removed, but authorities were still able to link it to DiMaggio using the VIN number, usually found on the dashboard. In the car, there were Walmart receipts from a store in the area, which showed he had purchased camping supplies, including a blue tent. 
Purely by chance, a group of horseback riders later reported that they had come across a man and a girl in the wilderness who seemed ill-equipped. The pair had been camped out at the Frank Church River of No Return Wilderness, which sprawls across 2.3 million rugged acres of cliffs, mountains, and river valleys in what is the second largest wilderness area in the contiguous United States. FBI planes began surveying the area from above and ultimately spotted a blue tent camped out near Moorhead Lake. Officers ultimately swooped in on the site after DiMaggio stepped away from the campsite to collect firewood. During the confrontation, he opened fire at officers who immediately shot back, causing DiMaggio multiple wounds that proved to be fatal. Hannah was left screaming, but had sustained no visible injuries despite being incredibly agitated. She asked officers about how DiMaggio was before being told he was not going to hurt her anymore. Hannah then asked about her mom and brother, but officers initially deflected and instead insisted that their main priority was getting her off the mountain safely and quickly. But the case was engulfed with rumors that plagued Hannah relentlessly. In the immediate aftermath, some had already begun to question her own behavior and relationship with DiMaggio. For example, there were 13 calls that were made between her and DiMaggio on the day of her abduction, before both phones were switched off simultaneously. Despite this curious nature of this fact, it was explained by San Diego County Sheriff's Office as the pair making arrangement for DiMaggio to pick her up from cheerleading practice. Discussing how it was that DiMaggio overpowered her during the abduction, Hannah said that he gave her a pill which she now believes to be Ambien. She has said she was unconscious from that moment until waking up in Idaho and has no recollection of even being put in this car. Several relatives at the time of the murders admitted to being deeply troubled by Hannah's apparent lack of grief and string of outlandish, often sexually precocious postings on social media. On the day of her mother and brother's funeral, she tweeted pictures of herself and a friend, fingers posed like guns with the hashtag, True Thugs. Some struggled to square the teenager's online persona and postings with her victim status. The 16-year-old's great-aunt, Jennifer Willis, told the author of the book, River of No Return, on the trail of Hannah Anderson and Jim DiMaggio, that the family hasn't seen her grieve at all. It's not the Hannah we know. It's downright disturbing, she said. Authorities have been adamant in their assertion that Hannah is the victim in every sense of the word. However, there would be several other twists in the tale. It was later discovered that DiMaggio had left a $112,000 life insurance policy in the care of Hannah's grandmother, Bernice. The beneficiary was changed in 2011 from DiMaggio's sister to Bernice with the expectation that she would take care of the two Anderson children with the money. Andrew Spanswick, a spokesperson for the DiMaggio family, announced in 2013 that his relatives were not challenging the insurance policy, but wanted a paternity test to find out if he was Hannah and Ethan's father. We were requesting DNA samples from Hannah and anything they can get from Ethan, he said at the time. There were rumors Jim was the children's real father. The parents didn't marry until 2002. We think it's strange he left them so much money with no explanation. But this was quickly dismissed by Stacy Hess, a spokesperson for Brett who said that the Andersons did not meet Mr. DiMaggio until the next month of Tina's pregnancy with Hannah. Brett Anderson's DNA was used to identify the body of his dead son, Ethan Anderson, she noted. The final bizarre revelation in the case came after it was discovered that DiMaggio's father, who was also called James DiMaggio, killed himself exactly 18 years to the day 
that his son was killed by the FBI. And the similarities between the elder DiMaggio's suicide and his son's death were uncanny. Back in 1989, James Sr. was also attracted to a 16-year-old girl, a woman claiming she was that girl previously said. James Sr. was dating her mother at the time, but the older man quickly grew interested in the teenager. He gave her concert tickets and showered her with attention, the woman said. She recounted that when James Sr. broke up with the girl's mother, he told her, He only stuck around because he was in love with me. He wanted to take me away to a better life. The woman said she rejected James Sr., who was 35 at the time, and a newspaper report from the time shows he was arrested in December of 1989 for breaking into a home and threatening teenage children with a sawed-off shotgun. She said he had handcuffs with him and threatened to kill her, her sister, and her boyfriend. She was able to escape unharmed after talking herself out of the situation. Six years later, on August 10, 1995, James Sr. killed himself. All right, dear listeners, this next story is very disturbing. If you are sensitive to anything crime-related, this story will not be for you. Listening discretion is highly advised. Junko Furuda Born November 22, 1972, Junko Furuda had just celebrated her 17th birthday three days prior. The Japanese teenager and junior, grade 11, attended Yashio Minami High School. On November 25, 1988, Junko left school and was walking home, although some reports say she was walking to her part-time job after school. She never made it home. She was kidnapped by a group of young men, including a 17-year-old who was identified as Joe and would be later given the surname Kamasaku. They kept her captive in the house owned by the parents of Kamasaku in the Ayase district of Adachi, Tokyo. This was the beginning of her 44 days of torture. She didn't know her abductors. They had no grudge against her, and there was nothing specific that they were after. They attacked her because they could, embarking on weeks of atrocities because they could, and because they wanted to. To forestall a manhunt, the kidnappers coerced Furuda into calling her mother and telling her that she had ran away from home, but was with a friend and was not in any danger. He also browbeat her into poising as one of the boy's girlfriends when the parents of the house where she was held were around. But when it became clear that the parents didn't care either way, he dropped the pretext. Day 1, November 22, 1988, kidnapped, kept captive in house, and posed as one of the boy's girlfriend, sexually assaulted, over 400 times in total. Forced to call her parents and tell them she had run away. Starved and malnutrition. Fed cockroaches to eat and urine to drink. Forced to masturbate. Forced to strip in front of others. Burn with cigarette lighters and set off fireworks in her ears, mouth, and vagina. Foreign objects inserted into her vagina and anus, including a still-lit light bulb. Day 11, December 1st, 1988. Severely beaten up countless times. Force held against concrete ground and jumped on. Hands tied to ceiling and body. Used as a punching bag. Until her damaged internal organs made blood run from her mouth. Nose filled with so much blood that she can only breathe through her mouth. Dumbbells dropped onto her stomach. Vomited when tried to drink water. Her stomach just couldn't accept it. Tried to escape and punished by cigarette burnings on arms. Flammable liquid poured on her feet and legs, then lit on fire. Bottle inserted into her anus, causing injury. 
Day 20, December 10th, 1988. Unable to walk properly due to the severe leg burns. Beaten with bamboo sticks. Fireworks inserted into her anus and lit. Hands smashed by weights and fingernails cracked. Beaten with a golf club. Cigarettes inserted into vagina and forced to drink her own urine as they laughed. Beaten with iron rods repeatedly. Winter. Forced outside to sleep on the balcony. Skewers of grilled chicken inserted into her vagina and anus, causing bleeding. And yet, she'd almost escaped. One time, she reached the telephone, but one of the boys caught her just in time and ended the call for help. They punished her by taunting her with a candle flame and finally doused her legs in lighter fluid and set her on fire once more as punishment for trying to run away. She went into convulsions. The boys would later say that they thought she was faking the seizure. They set her on fire again and then put it out. She survived this round. Day 30. Hot wax dripped onto face. Eyelids burned by cigarette lighters. Stabbed with sewing needles in chest area. Left nipple cut and destroyed with pliers. Hot light bulb inserted into her vagina. Heavy bleeding from vagina due to scissors insertion. Unable to urinate properly. Injuries were so severe that it took her over an hour just to crawl downstairs and use the bathroom. Eardrums severely damaged. Extreme reduced brain size. Day 40. Begged her torturers to kill her and get it over with. January 1st, 1988. Junko greets the New Year's Day alone. Body mutilated. Unable to move from the ground. Day 44. January 4th, 1989. The four boys beat her mutilated body with an iron barbell, using a loss at the game of Mahjong as pretext. She is profusely bleeding from her mouth and nose. They put a candle's flame on her face and eyes. Then, lighter fluid was poured onto her legs, arms, face, and stomach, and then lit on fire. This final torture lasted for a time of two hours. Chunko Furuda died later that day in pain and alone. Nothing compared to 44 days of suffering she had to go through. Less than 24 hours later, on January 5, 1988, the killers hid Junko's body in a 55-gallon drum, then filled it with concrete. They disposed of the drum in a tract of reclaimed land in Koto, Tokyo. When her mother heard the news and details of what had happened to her daughter, she passed out. She had to undergo a psychiatric outpatient treatment. According to their statements at their trial, the four of them sexually assaulted her, beat her, introduced foreign objects including an iron rod into her vagina, made her drink her own urine and was fed cockroaches, inserted fireworks into her anus and set them off, forced Feruda to masturbate, cut her nipple with pliers, dropped dumbbells on her stomach, and burned her with cigarettes and lighters. One of the burnings was punishment for attempting to call the police. At one point, her injuries were so severe that according to one of the boys, it took more than an hour for her to crawl downstairs to use the bathroom. They also related the possibility a hundred different people knew that Feruda had been imprisoned there. But it's not clear if this means they visited the house at different times while she was in prison there or themselves either sexually assaulted her or abused her. When the boys refused to let her leave, she begged them on several occasions to kill her and get it over with. Three of the boys' identities were sealed by the court because of their age, even though they were tried as adults. They pled guilty to a reduced charge of committing bodily injury that resulted in death, instead of the original charge of murder. Joe Kamasaku was released in 
August of 1999, and nearly five years later, he was arrested and served seven years for assaulting a jealous love rival, and according to others who knew him, and spent time in prison with him. He had been bragging about what he had done to Furuda. By 2004, Kamasaku, who was already released from prison for Junko's horrific murder, had allegedly renewed his contracts with the underworld and was in trouble with the law yet again. He was arrested for assaulting a 27-year-old acquaintance, Takatoshi Asanu. Upset that a woman in his life might be involved with Aisanu, Kamasuku tracked the man down, beat him, shoved him into his truck, drove him from Adachi to his mother's bar in Masadu, Furuta's hometown, and continued to beat him. During the four-hour-long beating, Kamasaku allegedly threatened to kill the man, telling him that he killed before and he knew how to get away with it. During his trial, Kamasaku admitted to the assault, but he denied that he'd referred to any previous murders or had threatened Asanu. Prosecutors wanted Kamasaku to spend another seven years in prison. They got a conviction and the sentence they wanted. Kamasaku has since been released again. Little Pauline Picard, age two, disappeared from her family's farm in Brittany, France, in April of 1922. An exhaustive search failed to find her, but several days later, police received news that a little girl who matched Pauline's description was found wandering in the town of Cherbourg, about 320 kilometers, or 200 miles, away from the Pickard farm. Pauline's parents arrived to examine the girl and announced that she was indeed their missing Pauline. A few unusual facts stood out about the otherwise happy reunion. First, the girl did not seem to recognize her parents. Second, she did not respond to them when they spoke to her in their native Breton. Dismissing these peculiarities, Pauline's parents took her back to the farm, where the neighbors quickly affirmed that she was Pauline, and the whole ordeal seemed to end on a happy note. About a month later, a neighboring farmer working near the Pickard farm stumbled upon something horrifying, the mutilated and decomposing body of a young girl next to her neatly folded clothes. He alerted the authorities, who arrived at the gruesome scene along with the town's inhabitants, among them Pauline's parents. Although the young girl's face could not be identified, the Pickards made an unsettling realization. The folded clothes were exactly what Pauline had been wearing on the day she disappeared. The area where the remains were found had been searched thoroughly when Pauline first disappeared, which suggested to detectives that someone had placed the body there fairly recently. The case became even more perplexing when the skull of an adult male was discovered next to Pauline's body, adding a second potential victim to the case. Early reports from the investigation indicated that there was one possible suspect. A few days prior to the discovery of the body, a middle-aged farmer visited the Pickard farm and asked them whether they were sure that the girl from Cherbourg was really Pauline. He then stated, God, forgive me, I am guilty. He erupted into hysterical laughter and was hauled off to an insane asylum. Even so, a myriad of questions still baffled officials and Pauline's parents. If the body in the woods was Pauline, as the evidence suggested, then what had happened to her? Was the laughing man the killer? How was the unidentified skull related to Pauline's murder? And who was the little girl from Cherbourg who had been living with the Pickards for a month? It remains unclear whether these questions were even answered. No definitive records exist of a resolution to the story.
Nyleen Marshall. When a four-year-old girl named Nyleen Marshall disappeared from a Montana campground on June 25th of 1983, police initially suspected she had wandered off into the woods. They were worried about her going out into the forest alone outside of Helena, but they had dealt with wandering children before and were confident they could locate her. As soon as her family called in her missing persons report from the campground, cops got to work. But as the investigation proceeded that day, they learned some very concerning details that made them think this wasn't a simple missing toddler case. Witnesses at the campground came forward to report having seen Nyleen speaking with a man in a purple jogging outfit earlier in the day. The outfit was memorable for campers in attendance, but they couldn't tell the cops much else, especially about the man's appearance. Police weren't able to find him on a jogging suit tip alone. To this day, his identity remains a mystery, but police felt then and still do now that he is the key to unlocking this case. With no other leads to go on, it was as if Nyleen had vanished into thin air. Police alerted the media, and the case was made public. Soon, it caught national attention, but millions of eyeballs didn't bring any more information to light. Two years later, in 1985, the NCMEC and the Child Fund of America were both contacted by a person mailing unsigned letters. Then, a man started leaving anonymous voicemails with the two organizations' offices. In them, he claimed he was the one who kidnapped Nyleen. He also said he was now raising her and his own daughter. At first, authorities were skeptical, but the man provided them with details that hadn't been published in any prior media reports. Soon, investigators felt they were dealing with an actual kidnapper. Police were able to trace the calls and letters to the Madison, Wisconsin area, but the trail went cold from there. The man stopped contacting the NCMEC, and he was never heard from again. John Gosh. John Gosh was on his paper route with his beloved pet dog in the early morning hours of September 5, 1982, when the unthinkable happened. The 12 year old boy was jumped by two unidentified men and thrown into the back of a car in West Des Moines, Iowa. The men quickly drove off with John in tow, leaving behind many questions and few answers. Soon, John's paper route customers started calling his family home, complaining that they hadn't gotten their paper. His parents assumed he'd overslept, but when they checked his room, he was gone. They called the police and cops started quizzing neighbors about what they had seen. Authorities began piecing together the timeline based on early witnesses' statements from the neighborhood. But nobody had a reliable report about what the two men looked like, and nobody got a good look at the car's license plate either. John's abduction proved to be a landmark case in many ways. For one, Des Moines' cops waited for 72 hours before beginning a full investigation into John's whereabouts. Most children of that era were runaways, and cops simply felt John would return soon. His parents knew better, but they were powerless to stop police procedures. After John's abduction, though, the policy changed nationwide. John was also the first child to have his face printed on the side of a milk carton. That practice would continue to happen for countless other children throughout the decade and onward to the new millennium. Curious events made the Gosh family terrified of the kidnapping, too. First, about six months after the 12-year-old disappeared, a boy in a parking lot was overheard screaming that he and John Gosh had been kidnapped. 
Cops couldn't track the kid down to confirm his story, though. He was gone by the time officers arrived. A year later, the Gosh family received a crumpled up dollar bill in the mail. Scrawled across it were the words, I am alive, and a signature that seemed to match that of the young preteen. Then, in 1997, John's mother, Noreen, claimed her son, who would have been nearly 30 years old by then, showed up at her apartment. During a late night meeting, the man claiming to be John said he'd been kidnapped by a pedophile ring and abused. He somehow managed to escape but had to stay hidden as to not draw their attention again. Nearly a decade later, in 2006, Noreen found several old photos that had been left on her doorstep. They showed images of tied up boys being abused. She believed one of the children to be her son. That has never been conclusively proven, but the continuous links back to John's kidnapping still remain a mystery to this day. Suzanne Bombardier Susie, or Susan, Bombardier was a 14-year-old girl living in Northern California with her family when she was kidnapped, sexually assaulted, and murdered in June 1980. She had been living in the city of Anatoc when she took a job babysitting one night that summer. She had agreed to babysit her adult sister's young nieces, so she spent the evening in her sister's townhome in the supposedly safe California town. However, sometime in the night, things went terribly wrong. When Susie's sister got home, she couldn't find the teenager anywhere. There was no sign of forced entry, but it wasn't like Susie to just wander off. So she called the young girl's parents, and the family then called the police. Cops came to the house and did a full investigation of the scene. They didn't uncover much evidence, but they did note the same thing Susie's sister had seen. There was no sign of forced entry into the townhome. If Susie really had been kidnapped and she wasn't just a runaway, cops felt like it was likely that she knew her abductor and had let them into the house of her own free will before being taken. As police scrambled to locate the girl, her family racked their brains, wondering who Susie could have come across on that fateful night. Five days later, Susie's remains were found by a local fisherman. They had been floating in the nearby San Joaquin River, about 60 miles east of San Francisco, and just a few miles away from where she was first abducted. For nearly four decades, the case went cold. Cops didn't have reliable evidence to track down a killer, and DNA technology was only in its infancy. For much of the time, the case had progressed. Police pressed media outlets to keep the case in the public eye, but it slowly faded. Concerned over the young girl's babysitting alone only became more pronounced. All over America, families stopped letting their teen daughters babysit for neighborhood children out of an abundance of caution. But then, in 2017, police got a break. A new DNA profile matched swabs from Susie's remains to a man named Mitchell Lim Bacon. He was a convicted sex offender who was known to Susie and her family at the time of the murder. He was charged in 2017 with kidnapping, sexual assault, and murder. And he was eventually convicted of those crimes. Police determined he likely convinced Susie to let him into the townhouse on that fateful night before kidnapping her and ending her life. Anne Gottlieb. Anne Gottlieb was a 12-year-old Soviet immigrant who disappeared from a mall in Louisville, Kentucky on June 1, 1983. 
The girl had been visiting Bashford Manor Mall with friends that day when she went missing. Her family lived just across the street from the mall, and she rode her bike over to hang out for only a few hours. But along the way, something terrible happened to the little girl. The police followed thousands of leads, but all of them proved to be dead ends. They focused on a convicted sex offender who they knew was at the mall when Gottlieb went missing, and another suspected serial sex offender in the area. No evidence was tied to either man, though, and the police never had enough to charge them. The Gottlieb abduction proved to be the tipping point for the work John Walsh had been doing on behalf of his abducted son, Adam. After she went missing, Walsh had enough backing to push the Reagan administration to go forward with the NCMEC. Gottlieb's abduction was also the first in America to employ the use of billboards and other mass media markers seeking attention. Prior to that, cops believed mass public awareness in cases of missing children was futile. But that changed after Gottlieb was swiped from the Kentucky Mall. Even as police and federal law enforcement officers scrambled to solve the little girl's abduction, answers never came. In 1990, a death row inmate in Texas claimed to have killed the little girl. He even provided a supposed map of where he had buried her body. Police excavated the site though and didn't find a single piece of evidence pointless to his involvement. Back to square one again. The kidnapping languished in cold case files. Then, in 2008, Louisville cops got a break in the case. They announced their determination that convicted sex offender Gregory Oakley Jr. He was the one responsible for Gottlieb's disappearance. He died in Alabama in 2002, but he had previously been convicted of sexually assaulting a 13-year-old girl with red hair and other physical features similar to Gottlieb. Oakley had also been convicted in Kentucky in 1984 of sexually assaulting another 13-year-old girl. Cops now believe Oakley followed Gottlieb into the mall parking lot that day in 1983 and swiped the little girl right off her bike. Tara Calico Tara Calico was 19 years old with the prime of her life ahead when she went missing from her neighborhood in Valencia County, New Mexico. The teenager was an avid cyclist for years who loved to bike along routes to school, work, and fun times with friends. For several years, her mother was in the habit of biking with Tara up and down the rural roads near their home. But one day in early 1988, her mother decided to stop biking so often after an unsettling encounter with a road-raging motorist. Tara continued biking alone, though, and on September 20th, 1988, it was possibly the last thing she ever did of her own free will. That day, Tara didn't come home after that long bike ride. Her family was terrified at her sudden disappearance and called the police to check on her. They also set out on a massive search for the girl, but she never turned up. They couldn't find any sign of her. Not even her bike was found anywhere along the route she typically traversed. Alarmed, her parents handed the investigation over to the police, but authorities in Valencia County didn't have much more to go on themselves. Soon, the case grew cold, and for a while, it seemed like it was destined to be a tragic but missing person cold case. Then, over the next several years, strange occurrences started making Tara's family believe she was still alive. The first came in a Florida parking lot in June of 1989. A person walking to their car found a bizarre Polaroid photo on the ground. 
In it, a woman was bound and held with duct tape over her mouth. A young boy was bound beside her as well. The person sent the photo to the John Walsh's show, America's Most Wanted, which broadcasted it and asked the nation for tips. Word got back to Tara's family, and her mother looked at the image. To her shock, the woman bound in the photo looked exactly like her daughter. She told the police, but cops didn't know how to track down the image's subject or its photographer. Two years later, cops came across another unsettling piece of photo evidence. At a construction site along the Pacific Ocean in tiny Montecito, California, workers found more photos of a woman tied up and bound. They turned them into the police, who again shared them with other agencies and the media. Once again, word got back to Tara's mother, and once again, the mom was shocked to see that the depicted woman resembled her daughter. The police have never been able to conclusively determine if it's really Tara in the photos. Still, her mother swears that it's her. There is at least one clue that leads police to believe it may be possible, though. In both instances, the film involved was manufactured and sold after the date of Tara's 1988 disappearance. And that, dear listeners, brings a close to these true kidnapping stories. I'd like to take a moment and acknowledge the reformed members of Back to Ashes. Tina Mead, Coldstone Wolf, Mrs. Innerscare, Luz Crispin, Tammy Slayton, C.A.G., Denise S., Samantha Place, Stephanie McLaren, Corpse Lover, Normie D.W., Christy Elias, Cindy Cleveland, and Patty's niece. If you are sleeping, I hope Slumberland is treating you comfortably. If you're awake, I hope you've enjoyed this collection. Until next time, please take care of yourselves. I'll be reading to you soon. Have yourself a good morning, a good afternoon, or good evening. Peace, love, and light to you all.